In this video, we're going to show you how to cut a mason's mitre kitchen worktop joint using a kitchen fitters jig, a half inch router, half inch cutters, and a few other bits and bobs that are needed for this job. And somehow, all these years, Brady working here and going through college, you've, you've never been shown no. a mason's mitre. No, no, never done it. It's, I, I find it a bit strange to be honest because you were at college a few years, weren't you? Yeah. MVQ2 and a bit, yeah. a bit beyond that. Uh, diploma, level one, two, and three, and then MVQ level two. Yeah, and they never did this never process. Did okay, so I don't do it very often, so I'm going to be talking it through partly to remind myself. The kit that we need is a kitchen router jig. These things are fairly standard, but they come in slightly different sizes with roundovers for other tasks sometimes. And a router, it needs to be a pretty powerful one, um, half inch, half inch collet. Um, that refers to the diameter of the shank of the router cutter, that's a half inch diameter. It so happens that for this process, the standard cutting diameter is also half inch or 12.7 millimeters. That has to be fitted with a guide bush. So this is a, a removable bushing that when the cutter's in there, acts as a, a spacer and a guide. So you can run it against the template and that's 30 millimeters diameter, which is what this is designed for. Although it's only a small round over, you really want to get that join between this and the return just right, or it's there's going to just be a little step or a little yeah. gap, which isn't good in the kitchen. What we're doing in this situation is we have got a right angle or near enough. I'm going to pre-cut it on the assumption it's going to meet at a right angle, but I'm going to leave these two bits that I'm preparing in the workshop overly long. So I've got a little bit of play to position them in the space. So this, this jig is set up, so you're going to create that mason's mitre. So you have, you have your little bit that's going to end up cutting the 45 and then you run straight. You've got two parts that are called the male and female part. So we're going to have this bit along the wall, the window there. That's the female part. This is the male part. This is a, a right hand joint. You obviously could have a piece going there and it would be, it would be the mirror image. Now there's a step that is worth doing, it's tempting to skip, and that is centering your bushing. You can't assume that straight from the factory, the motor and the spindle of the router is perfectly centered on this round base. Has it shifted? What? <laughs> well, you were at it longer than me. If I if I kept trying that long, I would have done it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the bushing there into that black thing—that's like a countersunk screw that's going to self-center. So that for what I'm trying to do now, that may as well stay locked in. This this black backer, you see, it has a bit of play. This thing, so that has a half-inch shank, same as standard router bit shank which means that obviously once it's in once it's in and tight it is it's centered you know it's it's, it's going to be like a, a center guide in the position that any router cutter would be and once it's tightened so what that's then doing is once that's into the bushing because it is a 30 mil disc on the end there that bushing is locked into a centered position so i can now lock those two screws into place and i'm confident that that is centered if it wasn't centered then as i'm routing if i twist the router slightly like i'm sort of routing through this groove if i moved a bit like that or like that then I might be moving the cutter a little bit closer to one edge or the other, and I'm going to get a less precise cut. Okay, so that's locked in place. I can take that out and put my cutter in. Now, when we get to the cutting, you don't really want to be clearing more than about 10 millimeters 
at a time to avoid putting too much strain on the cutter. This router, this is the Trend T11, which is made for a router table. We used to have the Trend T10, which the only difference was the adjustment was a, a lot more friendly to adjusting outside of a router table. This really is designed for that bit to lock into there and the adjustment to happen via that when it's upside down. So, but the T10 burnt out, so this is the one we're currently using. So you really want it to stop up safely out of the way and you can set up some tower stops so you can have these threaded rods which you just quickly turn around and I could set them up to like 10 millimeter increments which would stop against this. I don't think I'm going to bother really because you can just sort of eye it down. If I had a few to do I might take the trouble to set that up. I, I expect those threaded rods are in that box. Yeah. I think they've sort of worked loose, haven't they, in use, and it's been easier just to get rid of them. By the way, this one comes with uh, a different angle for when you, when you have got more of an obtuse angle. I think it's, I think it's probably for a 135 degree angle. Because when I picked it up, I thought they really don't look the same. Yeah, really I, suppose, I suppose that's another common angle. The kitchen designer might yeah. really make it obtuse, but at a specific angle. I've never actually used it. Right, so yeah, you could use this either way up. Now it is quite easy to sort of fix it a little bit off because you've only got quite a narrow bearing surface mm -hmm. between those two. So we want to make sure that's tight up to there. And you certainly want to make sure it's really tightly fitted on. Yes, it's worth it's worth just checking those are tied up against it. Do you want to just have a little look underneath. Now I could have I could have placed this more carefully near the edge to be taking less off, but I know I've made that quite a lot oversize, so I'm I'm not too worried about that. Yeah, so just to reiterate, the reason I'm doing this one upside down is. The router cutter is going to spin like that, and it's, sort of, it's going to cut in like that, which means as I break into that surface, I'm pushing the fragile melamine into the cut. If I was to have done it the other way up, I'd be breaking out, I'd get chipping. I'll cut through in like maybe three, three or four passes, but as I do it, I'll be pulling, I'll be pulling back so I'll be placing the bushing on the near side of the groove. When I've gone right through and I've got my cutter still sticking down beyond the thickness, I'll go back for a final pass, but I'll push towards the near side because this has deliberately got probably no more than a millimeter play so that your final pass is just a finishing cut and then you get your perfect, perfect edge. You can see if you look at that, from doing those multiple passes, it's not one nice neat cut. So you can see the benefit of doing the final pass that I'm about to do. You can also see that if I had done it the wrong way up and been cutting, coming out of the finished edge, you can see the level of chipping that you would have got. Something to be aware of as well is 
although this is a very rigid material, this bit here is now so unsupported, it's just relying on the rigidity from these points, that as you, as you do your final pass, um, you really want to be consciously tipping the weight of the router onto, onto there and holding that base plate flat onto there, not sort of slightly tipping back here, because otherwise with like 40 mil or so of, of router blade st sticking out, just a slight tilt is going to create an in inaccuracy. For that final cut, I like the tip to be quite well below because that's probably had the most wear. So if it's um, if the warm bit is sort of beyond where the finished cut needs to be, you're going to get the best result. I also want to think about with this router having a bit of a cut off there, it's better if the part of the base that has more bulk to it is on the jig. Now, I think what I did on that first pass was probably not take enough care, because I don't know if you could hear as I was cutting there, you could, fit, you could hear it cutting on some of it, and then there would be a bit of a gap where it wasn't cutting. And just looking at that edge now, I think even on that first pass, I was probably tipping a little bit too much. So I'm tempted now just to shunt this back a little bit and get a better final pass, just to be sure that top edge, which is the most prone to any slight variance, make sure that really is nice and straight. I can see that's a lot better. I could really see some wavering before and it's good and straight now. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now with that still in position, I think we'll go right on and do our bolt holes, our bolt slots. I'm fairly happy to do it the way I am in advance. I'll just I'll just reference off the finished edge. If if I find when I come to fit this this piece here, if I find I sort of need to scribe it in or something like that to the shape of the wall, I can then just like say if that ends up having a few mil off it, I can just take the same amount off this one. And uh, yeah, I think I'll be able to get these lining up and I'll be able to figure out on the site, keeping them in line and making sure that when it comes together, this is still in line. These are the old style bolts. They end up recessed in and they're a bit of a faff to tighten because you have to get a spanner in and just do it like a eighth of a turn until that falls tight. There is a new type a zip bolt where you get a, a drill fitting that drills that way continuously and it tightens up. So we can set that stop depth by getting our cutter drop down and touching the surface. We can then choose the, the stop that happens to be there. And then we can find, yeah, there we go. We can just about manage to get, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a red line here. This is a horrible piece of equipment, by the way. I really want to get a, a fest tool. I do not consider this to be a well-designed router, but there you go. <laughs> so that is on the zero point with that stopped against there with the cutter at like it's zero, it's zero point on the face. So for it to then drop down to 27, I need to give myself a gap of 27 above that tower stop and lock it off. So I'm going to move, that's right, I'm going to move that up until I can read off. 27 there lock that off and then I can't drop any deeper than I need to because that will stop on there yeah I'm doing the opposite of what I said my excuse is because I'm talking <laughs> I do these things even when I'm not talking
I just wanted to show that when you run around the profile, of course, you get this little edge bit, but that, that usually just sort of breaks itself off. But sometimes it can just get caught and jam and judder around. You just, you just got to watch for that, it's not a big deal. Yeah, so that's just that done. That'll go like that. I'll pull tight with the next one. Good edge. I mean, if I if I do the next one right, we should have a really good joint there. I'm not really seeing any wobbles in that. And here, that's that's just about perfect there. So now we use our F for female, and this is where these come in, it's for the female cut so that you position the cut for the right width of worktop, so as your male piece is coming up here, it's landing at the right width. We've got a 650mm option, but not a 670 which is what this is, so if I was to set it at 650 it would be 20 millimetres too far that way. So my, my male piece would come in and there'd be a step there. So I want to bring it over 20, which I can do. I can do by just giving myself a 20 mil line in. And then I can reference that through the holes. Always good just to do a little visual double check that you've you've thought it through correctly. You're always going to get a, a smoother cut when you're, you're pushing against the cutting action, which is usually pushing and going left yeah, to right. Yeah. But when it's when it's an enclosed cut, the the cutter is sort of working on both sides anyway. So mm -hmm. I guess it's it's not as dangerous as it normally would be when it might just climb. But yeah, I should get a better cut here where I'm just pure pushing into the cut. How would you fix that, even if it is wobbly, because you're referencing off that front face? You mean if it had been wobbly and gone in too deep? Yeah, so like it said that the, it said the edge wasn't yeah. true and straight. Yeah, because then if, if you went in deeper, you would definitely reveal yeah. some chipboard there. You could maybe try try cutting that one in more but then you, yeah, you're but out on never, your own yeah. with no sort of stops to yeah that's what i mean you can't reference you. off anything then yeah i mean i think 
on that cut, it shouldn't really be possible to wobble in deeper. Yeah. But if you're doing that cut upside down, yeah. and you, you tilted, you, yeah, your then that's it. cutter could, it could go in then, so it will be trickier. Chicken and thin as we go. You're getting good shots on that there. We've got, we've got nothing to put it tight, and we've probably got a little bit of a bow on the board that we're yeah. sat on, but it's looking pretty good. Well, that should be it for the routing. We'll get some dominoes in. So some people wouldn't bother because you can put some glue in the joint. You can pull it tight with your bolts, and uh, you can sort of knock it, knock it to flush. But I do like having a positive location. We decided to use biscuits because we don't have the dominoes, don't have the combination of domino and cutter that we wanted for this. Uh, and we've got a stock of biscuits from when we used to have a biscuit jointer. I'm going to just use this 4mm grooving cutter that's got the right depth setting for a fairly typical biscuit. Now I'm not, I'm not too fussed about the exact depth of this as long as it lines up on both pieces. Can you see it? Now I just had a call from Howden's saying they're going to close my account because I never buy from them and all of a sudden I want to pick up some colour fill. Yeah if you're not if you're not familiar watching this colour fill is it's not exactly a glue, it's really just a, a filler, but it seals, it seals the joint. So this is the final joint. It's perfectly good. It's ever so slightly misaligned just because of the weight of the unit, uh, weight of the countertop, which is lifting up slightly. But when we come to fit it, we'll take a bit more care that as it pulls tight, it's totally flush. As I said, with the colour fill, that will be a very good joint.